thank you for getting into this week's episode. You guys are going to love it. My guest is uh, is incredible. Probably the best uh, top three interviews I've had in the last couple couple of years. And we are talking about entrepreneurship, but we also weave in capitalism. Uh, we talk about uh, a lot of what the theme was in 2018, uh, life, liberty, and property. And it was fascinating. It was, it was awesome to talk to this individual. And super intelligent, very distinguished, uh, was a senior advisor to uh, President uh, George W. Bush. Uh, but let me, let me introduce him for you. So uh, Peter Weiner is my guest, and he is a senior fellow currently at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He also is a contributing editor at The Atlantic Magazine. He is also a contributing columnist for The New York Times. He is the former, as I mentioned, director of the White House Office of Strategic Initiatives and senior advisor to President George, George W. Bush. And he has authored a few books, uh, the wealth, uh, wealth and justice, the morality of democratic capitalism, and his most recent book that came out uh, last uh, month or the month of June, depending on when you're listening to this, June 2019, uh, called the death of politics. You guys are gonna love it. It's an awesome interview. Make sure you go if you're listening for the first time or you're just getting into the podcast. Uh, go back and check out you know the the seasons of 2018. You can also go onto YouTube. All most of the podcasts are video based, including this one, and you can you know go and kind of binge watch uh, different seasons if uh, if you will. All right. Without further ado, uh, let's get into my incredible interview with Peter Weiner. Enjoy. Peter, uh, it is amazing to have you on today. I'm really excited for uh, this this conversation, and uh, and to just talk to you about you know your your book uh, as well as some of the things that you've been preaching for a while. So welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be with you. Now you know I, I talked to you a little bit before we recorded about what we've been doing over the last uh, you know year and a half, two years, which is really focusing on the uh, topics that. Uh, you know, include life, liberty, property from uh, some John Locke's writings, uh, as well as what capitalism is, uh, entrepreneurship, and really just kind of the framework where I would say most people are wanting to, uh, you know, be, be a part of, not necessarily just in the U.S., but around, around the world. You know, and, and so I look at, you know, what you've written about and, uh, you know, and understood, it sounds like, for, for quite, uh, quite some time, uh, kind of studying and looking at, you know, where our society is and what has made us successful versus, uh, you know, other nations, uh, perhaps. Like, what do you, how have you come to understand just capitalism in, in general and the, dyna- and the you know, aspects, the dynamics of capitalism? Yeah, well, uh, you know, my argument, my belief is that capitalism is the greatest economic system in human history because it's lifted more people um, out of poverty than any system in in, in human history and um, allowed for the conditions for for great human flourishing, for great technological advancements. Um, Capitalism, uh, unmitigated and unrestrained, has obviously some problems, and, and part of what democracies and free societies have to do is to soften some of the rougher edges of that. That's a prudential judgment. What does that mean? What, what, what kind of programs have to be done to do that? Uh, you have to weigh the costs and benefits in te- terms of the effects on economic growth and, uh, and all of the rest. Uh, and it's my belief that capitalism works because it's most consistent with human nature. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, in, in the idea that you have to conform your economic and political systems to certain realities about about uh, human nature uh, and I think capitalism accords to that as aligns with with uh, with that it understands uh, as Adam Smith talked about uh, what, to what uh, you know selfishness rightly understood is that you have to take into account what drives and motivates people that you can't believe simply in altruism even though altruism is a part of, of, of human life and human experience uh, but but people act in ways that advance their self-interest, uh, self-interest rightly under, understood. Uh, and you have to create certain incentives um, that, uh, that will uh, tr- lead human beings to act in the ways that, um, that is both expected of them, but also advances the, the, uh, the common good. And, and I think the American understanding of capitalism by and large 
is the right one. Uh, limited government, entrepreneurship, free markets, uh, skepticism about uh, about the the ability of of government, particularly the federal government, central to, government, yeah, uh, central, yeah, centralized government to uh, dictate decisions, and uh, and uh, believe that it has the capacity to anticipate and direct. Um, all aspects of human life. I, I think Hayek has been proven right. There's an epistemological modesty that capitalism understands, which is that you can't get a small group of very bright people who can run society or run economies. Uh, and the way that economies work best is <clears throat> letting people by and large to be free to act in ways that, that they want to uh, want to act. Well, let me pick, let me go, go into two things that you had, you had said because I find this interesting. So it, it sounds like you know there's this there's this altruistic pull uh, of of human beings to be charitable, to to help others, uh, to to contribute, give back. But then there's also this you know invisible hand, selfish not selfish but self interest, maybe more self interested. Yes. So it, it seems like those two things are. Um, you know, kind of pulling, you know, pulling against each other. So are, are they mutual ex mutually exclusive or is it, you know, maybe uh, just a, a mischaracterization of those two concepts? Yeah, I don't, I don't think of them as mutually exclusive. Uh, I think that they're, they can be complementary. They're distinct. Huh. And again, they're part of human nature. And I, I think if you probably think about your own life, the lives of your friends, the lives of your family, you probably see both of those elements uh, in, in them. There, there are times in which you see altruism, uh, self-sacrifice, selflessness, uh, acts of charity, acts of sympathy, uh, acts of compassion. Um, and those things are real and they exist and they should be encouraged where they can. Um, on the other hand, all of us act in our self-interest as well. Uh, we that's, that's the way we're designed. That's the way that we operate. Most of life is acting in our self-interest, um, provided that it doesn't run over the rights uh, of, 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 uh, of other people. Uh, and none of us are completely selfless, uh, self-giving, uh, completely compassionate, uh, completely sympathetic. Um, and you have to take that into account. And that's not a bad thing, as long as it's, again, channeled in the right, in the right way. I think that the, the trick here is to try and take those human realities and direct them in a way that advances the, the, um, you know, the, the common good. I think the founders uh, understood this. I think that their view of, of, of human nature was basically correct, right, which is that uh, people are capable of, of virtue uh, and nobility. Uh, but also uh, acts of of, uh, of of recklessness and and uh, and irresponsibility and evil, uh, and you have to take both of those things into account. My own sense, I'm a person of the Christian faith, as I think that the Christian understanding of human nature is essentially the correct, because I think it's essentially that too, which is that vice and virtue. Uh, are intermingled in, in people's uh, in people's lives and in and in people's hearts, and it's 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 a complicated uh, it's a complicated um, mix. Um, and people in different seasons in life uh, lean in more, you know more of one direction than another. And the the the, uh, the challenge in individual lives as well as as a, as a society is to try and emphasize and, and give force and power to, to to the higher things and to mitigate the uh, the lower things well maybe let's let, let me go back to a, a second thing but i do want to hit on a few of the things you just said mm -hmm. but go to this this idea of central governance or, or or central powers dictating you know what people what people should should do or taking care taking care of them i think is you know, kind of the banner sometimes in which central governance is is looked to as a as a virtue. Like, what what is it about that structure that goes against or that people don't end up liking? Right. I think the you know the ideal side of things that they they push to or talk about sometimes are are intriguing, right? And I see that right. why they would appeal to people. But what right. when it comes down to it, why do people kick against that? Why does that impede human progress, or does it? Well, I mean, you have to take facts and circumstances, right? Sometimes when a centralized government, national government has acted, it's advanced great good. And sometimes often it's, it's, uh, it's done, done the opposite. 
Um, I'm somebody who believes in limited government and is wary of centralized government. I'm a conservative, lifelong conservative, and, and that's what's shaped my beliefs in part because the way I understand conservatism uh, is that it's based very much on human experience. That is, it's a negation of ideology, as Russell Kirk and others have, sa have said. So you have to take into account what works for, 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 the, for the human condition. I'd say that there are several reasons for it uh, in terms of why one is skeptical of centralized power. One is, is simply on the efficacy standpoint. Uh, Peter Schock uh, wrote a, a book uh, recently um, about uh, why government fails. And uh, it's he is, uh, a, I think he refers to himself in the book as a militant mo moderate, if I remember his phrase militant correctly. Moderate. That's good. <laughs> yeah, and so he's not a, an ideological person, um, but it's just an empirical look at, how, at what it is about large government that just doesn't, doesn't work very often, uh, that, that, that fails, where the efficiency is just not what it, not what it ought to be. And anybody who's worked, there, if they're honest, would would concede that that fact how often these grand promises and hopes that are that are sincere and real don't translate in, in, in into uh, into reality and I think you could look at much of the great society uh, and and uh, and and see that and even programs which which uh, have done some good but have also uh, are, are themselves, I think, extremely inefficient, like Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and I wouldn't argue that the, no good comes out of them. I don't think that's that that's sustainable. But I, but those programs are 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 not nearly as efficient as they as they could be. So I'd say the efficiency and efficacy, uh, or in inefficiency and lack of efficacy for centralized government is something that we need to be alert to. Then there's the concern that the founders themselves had, uh, and many others have had, which is when you centralize power, there's the danger of um, of, of authoritarianism and, and and even totalitarianism. Uh, that you know, as the as the old maxim goes, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we've seen time after time after time that when people get a tremendous amount of power, when it's unchecked, when it's unchallenged. Uh, that that can lead to to, to some very bad situ conditions and situations, and, and that was really the the worry of of the founders, and that's the reason that they set up our system of government of checks and balances, and um, separation of powers, because what they wanted was not an efficient government; they they wanted a government that that protected against um, against uh, tyranny. So I think that's that's a second reason that uh, that that people need to be wary about uh, about uh, about centralized government and again the third reason is that I think if you go back and you read you know Adam Smith in a certain way and Hayek probably more specifically this idea about if we, if we can use the word epistemological modesty but we were talking about earlier which is I think that there's this mythology among progressives which is that um, uh, that if you just get a group of wise men, wise women, they can uh, oversee and conduct and, and, and determine how human society can act in all sorts of realms that simply isn't possible. They can't do it. And there's so many imponderables in life, so many contingencies in life, that the idea that a centralized state or a group of individuals would, would be able to, to make those judgments, I just don't think, uh, works. And fourth thing I'd say is George Will in a marvelous new book that he wrote called The Conservative Sensibility um, writes uh, about the American founding. And he says that's essentially what conservatives need to conserve, which is the idea of inalienable rights, natural rights, rights that precede government. And his argument, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a valid point, is that government, uh, if it gets too large, too centralized, can undermine uh, those those uh, those natural rights. He he makes the case in a pretty persuasive way. I'd say that the belief in natural rights would tend to lead one toward a more limited government. Well, let's maybe go to your go to your book because you you look at you know the, just the idea ideas of capitalism and just the word itself 
uh, formulates a, a specific reaction in people as, as far as my experience is concerned. And it's not necessarily based on, you know, logic and thought through, uh, you know, education debate and uh, where a person comes to an understanding. It's more based on what has been heard, right? What yeah. society believes about that word. So maybe talk about your, uh, your best-selling book, Wealth and Justice, The Morality uh, of Democratic Capitalism, and, and kind of weave that into the conversation, talking about how that uh, can essentially be a, a message that will hit on the, the principles that make capitalism good for society, as opposed to what most people react to, uh, which is that it exploits people and takes advantage of people. And it's all about, you know, the wealthy and them getting their own. Yeah, I, I co-authored some monograph of the American Enterprise Institute with, with Arthur Brooks, uh, who was for many years president of uh, American Enterprise Institute. He just left recently, actually, to take a professorship at, at Harvard. And Arthur is very, very good and a very sober and thoughtful voice on, on this kind of, um, of thing. Look, I think capitalism is, we wrote this book a, a few years ago, and the situation is actually more acute now than it was when we wrote it. And, and at that time, that one of our concerns was that capitalism, is, that, that uh, Americans in general, and particularly young Americans, were losing faith in, in capitalism. Um, as a system, and, and we see that now in, in the uh, polls, and you're probably more familiar with them than I am, but the support for socialism is uh, higher than any time in my lifetime, and probably higher than at any point since the early part of the 20th century, I would guess. Uh, and you see this in, in contemporary politics with the Democratic Party, right, Demo who, who are two of the hottest commodities, hottest political figures in democratic politics, Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, uh, Cortez. And uh, they're both self-proclaimed democratic uh, socialists. Uh, and if you watch the democratic debates um, these days, you see um, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren essentially taking an anti-private enterprise stance. There's almost a reflexive hostility to anything having to do with capitalism or corporations. It doesn't mean that those certain corporations uh, don't deserve criticism, but it's a kind of reflex. So you've seen this rise in in, in respect for uh, uh, and, and uh, to some degree enthusiasm for socialism and a decline in confidence in capitalism. And that's that's a problem. Some of that is is probably or undoubtedly a result of the uh, of, of the Great Recession in, in, in 2008. Um, and I think that the uh, income inequality, uh, income gap uh, between the most wealthy and, and, and the rest of society probably has had more of an effect uh, on, on, on the general public than, um, than a lot of people on the right uh, thought that it would. It seems to have permeated society and, and the, the belief that, that, uh, that the, uh, the very rich are, are uh, making out like bandits and the rest of us are, are, uh, are not, um, and that so much of the gains in, in wealth, in, you know, uh, money from, from the market, um, that that has happened. We've had, as you know, wage stagnation from, from pretty much the entire part of the 21st century. Wages have been much flatter, and it's a complicated set of reasons for why that's happened. I wouldn't blame that on any single president. Uh, certain certain uh, trends, deep trends, are, uh, are, are in, in play here, which, which I'm guessing you've covered in, in your podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there seems to be uh, a lack of faith in capitalism, and that's given rise to populism, uh, which, which I'm wary about um, as a conservative. Um, I think populism can often be uh, antithetical to capitalism. I think it can be antithetical to uh, to reason itself. Um, it's, it's, uh, well, for, I think it first goes to reason because yeah. there is no, I would say there's less reason today than ever before. And I think it may be the deluge of information that's all around us and individuals you know, can't fit anything else into their head. And so therefore they take the, you know, efficient approach and leverage the belief system of someone they feel is like them. And it's yeah. interesting to see how society 
has been wired to think a certain way. And it's not necessarily the beliefs associated with reason and debate and personal individual understanding. It's right. it has to do with it's, it's, gr it's group thinking, uh, you know, dictated by very persuasive people like your AOCs and, and Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that, and there's just a rage at the system, the establishment, and and a and a feeling. I think it's almost a kind of quasi nihilism, uh, and you see this in in I think toward capitalism. I think you see it toward the politics in general, which is this idea that we have to burn down the village to save it. Things couldn't be worse. Let's just toss the whole thing aside. I think that's what p explains in part the the Donald Trump, the rise of Donald Trump. I've been a very strong and persistent critic of. Of Donald Trump, uh, in large part on conservative grounds, um, but I think what he tapped into is a sense that people wanted a wrecking ball to come in and 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 uh, just shatter uh, things. I think that's 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 a deeply anti-conservative impulse, but I think he he tapped into it effectively. I've told friends of mine uh, who who are pro-capitalism as as I am, pro-free market as I am, that I think it really is important to, to do study or set of studies to really understand what happened, what, what explains the loss of faith in capitalism, the rise in, in uh, affinity for, for socialism, uh, both attitudes and specific episodes and incidents that explain it, um, to understand in a, in, in a thoughtful way what is driving it, what are the attitudes, what, what is associated now with, with free market and capitalism. Um, and then to think through how do we tell the story? What's the narrative? What's, what's, the, uh, what, what's the tale we have to tell to remind people um, why capitalism is a system that has brought so much human flourishing and done so much to encourage human dignity. You, see, you know, it's, I think it was Orwell who said that the first duty of a responsible man is a restatement of the obvious. Sometimes you have to restate what's obvious or what you thought was obvious. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed this in, in, in life and in politics and in economics and in all sorts of realms, which is sometimes people uh, forget to make the arguments in, in some deep way, some fundamental way. Why is it that we believe what we believe? Um, and that's understandable. You know, so you, you think that, that certain victories are won, that certain arguments are settled, and you just act on that assumption. And uh, sometimes without quite knowing it, without quite realizing it, the, the, uh, the, the floor uh, breaks. And all of a sudden, that confidence that people had or that understanding, those shared assumptions are gone. And I think when it comes to capitalism, it's quite important for people who are defenders of capitalism and free market to make those arguments again, not, not to, to be dismissive toward the critics, uh, not to laugh at them, not to say these uh, ideas are stupid and therefore shouldn't be repudiated. Don't even engage in name calling, just say socialist, 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 and hope that that is enough. I think we, we have to do more work, uh, deeper work, more fundamental work to make the case again. And, and in a sense, to win the allegiance, to win the hearts of, of, uh, of ordinary Americans uh, and to explain to them why, why uh, capitalism is an is a economic system worthy of their, uh, of their loyalty. Hey everyone, Patrick here. Listen, most of you know that I wrote a book last year called Heads I Win, Tails You Lose, a financial strategy to reignite the American dream. And the book has, has sold tens of thousands of copies. We're really excited about it. So for those of you who are new listening and haven't had your chance to pick one up, you guys can actually get it for free. So if you head over to thewealthstandard.com forward slash book, then all you have to do is pay for shipping and you will get your a copy for free. So head over to thewellstandard.com forward slash book. Thanks for the support. Well, let me let me use some way maybe too abstract of a uh, uh, an example as as you may be used to. But there is a documentary that I I saw a few months ago called Behind the Curve, and it was essentially about this group of people, millions of people that came together trying you know basically stating that the world is flat. And the documentary was done by, you know, a non like flat earther, 
But it was interesting because, you know, he took this approach and it's a completely, you know, it's, it's ir- a very irrational thought, but yet millions of people were gravitating toward this. Wow. And it was all driven by this um, emotional desire that they have to fit in within a group Yes. Usually a group of people that don't, you know, believe what everybody else believes. Yep. And what was fascinating to the point you just made is the per, the individual who was doing the documentary, uh, the, the producer, they uh, essentially interviewed astrophysicists and they were saying, do you know that, you know, do you know that there, there's this group out there that, you know, millions of people that believe the earth is, is flat. Right. And it's fascinating because it takes you through this, you know, psychological yes. merge of what I think you're speaking to. Because the astrophysicists, in the end, basically said that you know these people don't know what we know, so we can't assume that they do and make an argument from that standpoint. Yeah, it comes down to you have to meet them where they're where they're at and why they've come to that conclusion. Because if you start to make them wrong, right, or make them feel stupid, it's just going to strengthen their argument. Right. Yeah. I think it fits within, you know, the, the uh, confines of what you've been talking about. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting observation. I'm actually intrigued. I'd like to see that that documentary. That whole area does fascinate me, I must say. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Jonathan Haidt, who's a marvelous uh, moral psychologist. He used to be at University of Virginia. He's now at uh, NYU. And he wrote a book several years ago called The Righteous Mind. Mm-hmm. And... Um, he actually now spends a lot of time with a group called Heterodoxy, which is an effort to, to uh, defend free speech on campuses yeah. against yeah. speech codes and so forth. Jonathan himself has been on an interesting um, journey, an interesting pilgrimage. He started out as, a, I think, a traditional person of the left, a progressive, and is now much more of a centrist, in part because of what his research has taught him. I've learned a lot. He's a very intelligent uh, and thoughtful guy and, and a very good guy as well. And his work on confirmation bias and motivated reasoning has, um, is, is really outstanding. And I've learned a lot from it. And it goes to the point that you're making. So I think a lot of us believe that the positions others hold and that we hold are, um, are derived at through some kind of disinterested uh, analysis of the facts and reasoning. And that reasoning has, 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 has brought us to what we believe free of emotion and all the rest. And in fact, what we know about brain science and, and now human nature, the more we're discuss- looking into these things, is that so much of what we believe is a product of transrational or subrational forces, uh, that we have dispositions and tropisms and predilections. Uh, we're products of, of our uh, or families of origin, our life experience, the people we're around, the communities we're a part of. And that sense of, of fitting in with communities um, is, is extremely uh, strong. And we know from, from brain science that when you get information that confirms what you already believe, it's a kind of a dopamine effect, a rush, a, 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 a high. And on the flip side, when there's information that challenges certain basic assumptions, your brain puts up often a kind of wall uh, uh, to, 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 or a, sh- a shield to block those things out and that it's actually genuinely uncomfortable for people to, to hear information that challenges them. And I'd say if in my own life and politics and, and, and just human relationships over the last 10 or 15 years, that's one area where, where I've changed. In the past, when I would have differences with people, I would often write um, long emails fact base, point by point, you know, people who know me would think, you know, I was built to respond to some of these issues um, in terms of, of, of debating, right? Uh, empirical evidence, uh, premise, facts to support it, conclusion. And what I've discovered is no matter how strong your argument is, and it's never as strong as you think it is, but let's just assume for the sake of the argument that the case that I presented, you and I were having a debate, the case I presented uh, against you was overwhelming by any objective standard. The odds are not only that you wouldn't change your position if, if in fact uh, I overwhelmed your, your, your case, you would probably, as you were indicating, dig your heels in more. 
Um, and so it's quite rare to shift people's views. And I've seen this in, in, in theology, in, 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 in the world of Christianity, in the world of politics, in all sorts of worlds. Where there is a chance, I think, actually, to get some deeper understanding is when people feel safe, when they feel heard, when they believe that you uh, know their arguments and at least can state them and understand them, even if you disagree with, with them. And if there's a human connection and a human relationship, if you have, in a sense, standing in somebody else's life, and that will allow them to let you in and to make their case and, and vice versa. That, uh, Alan Jacobs, who's a professor at Baylor, used to be at Wheaton, uh, called a, wrote a book recently called How to Think. And he refers to a foundation that uh, when they conduct debates, the first thing that they require is that the people debating, person A, person B, that person A states the position of person B in such a fair-minded way that person B believes that it is a fair restatement of their views and vice versa. That is the precondition before the debate goes on. And I think if that kind of thing happened more often, we'd get a lot further along. This is, we know this from the, from, from the social science evidence. We are as polarized as we have been since uh, Reconstruction. It's a deeply polarized society. And when that happens, people tend to go into their own camps and they shut off uh, people who have alternative views. And, and I think that's happening in all sorts, sorts of realms, including in the realm that we're talking about, uh, free market and capitalism. So that really goes to, to the larger discussion we're having, which is how do you make the case uh, in a way that the people will, will, who are, who could conceivably be open to an alternative case uh, are. No, you're, you're hitting on everything that has been going through my mind over the last, I would say, six, six months. And what you said over the last two, three minutes was, was brilliant. And that's where I look at, you know, just my, my experience and, and kind of what I was trying to get to with the whole idea of central governance. People don't like to be told what to do. And it, it, it kind of, it, they, they fight. There's this fighting response to it that I think goes into what you were referring to as our kind of our unconscious, right? Or what's built into our wiring. Yeah. And, and that right there, you know, in, includes a lot of when we had to you know, survive where we don't necessarily have to survive anymore, but yet those instincts are still there. Yeah. And when a person feels attacked, it's one is I would assume that it's very similar to being attacked by, you know, saber tooth tiger or, or, right. you know, some animal. Right. And, and that's where we have to, you know, I look at, you know, AOC and I look at uh, Donald Trump in a, in a new way, especially the last couple of years where I think in a sense, they understand psychology. And they're using what people will respond to as talking points and statements, and people fall fall prey to it all the time. It's it's incredible. Yes. Where he, and that, and I look at just the psychology side of things, and going to you know where where uh, economics really is, and usually the argument for capitalism is it tends to be you know the rational thinking. But I look at what wire how human beings are wired, and it's it's the majority of it's emotional. Yeah. And, and that's where I look at, you know, the, the values and principles approach has something that intrigues me as opposed to uh, labels uh, like capitalism or like dem Democrats or progressives or liberals or it's, you know, it's looking at principle as opposed to labels because labels immediately either puts you in that camp or right. excludes you. And you're going to believe, right, if you're in the camp, you're going to believe what the camp believes. And if you're excluded, you're not going to believe it. Yeah. That's well said. I, I, I agree with that. You know, labels, they, I mean, they exist for a reason because they, 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 they label something. They identify certain identify, yeah. worldviews. But, but I think th these days that the labels, by and large, are probably counterproductive. And as you say, once the labels are cast about, then you're putting people in categories. They're putting you in categories. And then it becomes awfully neat and tidy uh, and untrue. Um, and it doesn't really allow for flexibility uh, for, for, for nuance, um, which really is what human life and, 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 uh, and experience is about, uh, right? Which is you, you learn things, you refine your thinking, you recalibrate, you, new facts, yep. new conditions arise, and you try and adjust accordingly. Um, but if you're in this, these boxes, these ideological boxes, these theological boxes, it's 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 very hard. You know, it's it's interesting. I've had these conversations with Trump supporters because I'm a lifelong conservative, 
And I've worked in three Republican administrations and in a Republican White House. So I have a lot of friends who, who, who are Republicans. And because I've been so critical of Trump, they're puzzled or upset or, by it. So I've had a lot of conversations, many of them good. Um, it's, sometimes it's taken an effort to make sure that the relationships <laughs> don't, don't, don't fray. Uh, but there, and, and it's been helpful for me because I've been able to hear their perspective and understand where they're coming from. But I must say that there are times in which one makes a demonstrable or empirical claim as it relates to Donald Trump that, that's a criticism of him. Let's say it's something about that he's lied and there's just demonstrable evidence uh, that, that, that it's a lie. And it's been fascinating to me how it just doesn't break through. It, it's, it is as if they think that that's the thread and the whole thing can come apart. And if they concede one thing, that, uh, that, that the whole project co comes apart. And, uh, and I've experienced this throughout my life in politics, you know, particularly when you're in the White House, so many of the issues that you confront are complicated issues. You have very intelligent people arguing different policies and different points of view. Um, and often the decisions are 60, 40, you know, or 65, 35. It's not a hundred percent arguments on one side and 0% on, on the other. And that's part of what discretion and judgment and prudence and wisdom is in, in governing, which is this ability to hear these arguments, which sound potentially equally persuasive, thinking through which is the one that is most appropriate given the circumstances we're in, uh, what are the contingencies that we have to anticipate, but are really actually unknowable? Uh, how, how do you, if you're, if you're deciding, for example, a set of policies that you want to roll out, what's achievable politically and not? What's, what's the composition of Congress? You, you might want to push some elements of privatization of Social Security, say which you could believe is the right thing to do, but maybe it's not achievable and maybe you have to do something ahead of that. So these are all very, very complicated issues to, to take into account. As I said, often they're choosing one set of policies over and against another one or 60, 40. But then when you get into the actual discussion, it's like the, those differences disappear and that, that, that weighing of pros and cons disappears. And it's as if all the arguments are on one side and none on the other. And that once you settle on an, on a position, there seems to be some kind of reflex that we have that says, I can't concede a single point to the other person or to the other side, because if I do, it'll weaken my case and I can't possibly weaken my case. And then you just have people shouting talking points at each other and, and talking past each other and refusing to really engage each other and saying, for example, you know, that's a valid point. And I think you're right. I just think that the other arguments on my side outweigh the good point that you're making. That's all very complicated and very challenging stuff. But I think it, it, it in part explains why our politics is as broken as it is. Well, it comes, this has been fascinating. I'm, I'm, and hopefully I'm not for, for listeners. This is like, I, I love having these conversations. Hopefully this is valuable to, to you, but some of the things you're, you're saying, you know, it, it really comes down to this, you know, somebody mentioned a few moments ago, which was in relation to human connection. I think all people want to connect, right? They want to have a relationship. Uh, at the same time, there's this, you know, instinctive protection that they have where they don't want to be, they don't want to look bad. They don't want to be wrong. Right, because what that does is it invalidates their identity to to an extent. Exactly. Uh, but when you break down those walls, it's amazing what what can happen. Because people either a, a value is a value, or a principle is a principle, or it's not. Right. And I think most people would concede to capitalistic principles if it wasn't labeled capitalistic principles. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> these are you know these are principles of, of life in a sense. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll kind of end end with this, and I'll let you have the final final word. Um, there's something I thought about recently, which was interesting to me. I, I, I have little kids, two teenagers and a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. And it, we, we went to the Disney Alani Resort on Oahu uh, a couple years ago. And when I was there, there's like this central pool section. And there were these, these two guys that were, you know, and I hate to stare, well, I'm not, I hate to, I'm stereotyping. They, they had these the big earrings, 
big, big guys with these tattoos on their arms and like hardcore guys. Right. And, and I was able to have a conversation with them and they were there with their kids. Right. And we were in this environment in which the walls were broken down and you can have that connection. Yet if I went to their neighborhood and was walking down the street at night, right. (laughs) The, the environment changes, walls are up and the outcome is not going to be the same. Right. Yeah. Look at just, you know, human beings are, are wired in a certain certain way and we want certain things and and they're they're very similar. Yet because of these, you know, walls that, that come up and are reinforced, it's difficult to have the collaboration that's needed, the connection that's needed in order to make more even more progress. Yeah, that's a very interesting story. And I think it, 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 it touches on these these deeper truths that we're that we're talking about. Um, an awful lot of this is is what you described, which is a sense of identity. I, what that's just so basic to human beings: a, a feeling of belonging, a feeling of community. And it's pretty rare to find people who will take stands that will put them at odds with their, the community that's most important to them. Um, and that I think explains a lot of the a, a lot of the political tribalism. But we've got to find a way uh, to try and, and break down these walls you're describing. There's a there's some lovely verse in the New Testament about um, about uh, breaking down the dividing walls that exist uh, b- between between people. And when those walls are up, uh, it it usually means that that life is going to be harsher, less less sympathy, um, more anger. Uh, more antipathy, and then people begin to view other other folks not as individuals that you disagree with, but as enemies, enemies of right. the state, enemies of your cause. And then what can quickly kick in is dehumanization, uh, which is if you see things different than I am, it's not because you've analyzed things r- wrongly, that you made an intellectual error, but that you're morally defective, that there must be something wrong. something wrong with you. If you don't see things the same way I do, then you don't value the same things that I do. Uh, and in fact, you're, 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 you're a threat to, um, to them. And then we see that in, in contemporary politics. Um, we know from, from, from the, uh, the data that the attitudes that Republicans and Democrats and progressives and conservatives have toward each other, it's much more personal than, than, uh, ever before, and, uh, and there's a feeling that uh, that uh, these are not just you know differences of policy, but uh, but that they are uh, character uh, flaws and and faults. And and when that happens, and you feel like you're being attacked, uh, you know, on on that that depth of that that fundamental level. Uh, that you uh, you're an alien, that you're you're a malicious force, that you're a malignant force, that you want to hurt me and you want to hurt everything that I know and love. When that happens, a lot of bad stuff kicks in, and we've got to break we've got to break through that, and we have to deepen the understanding and sympathy that we have for one another. You know, there's uh, in in the book that I just wrote, the death of politics, um, how to heal our frayed republic after Trump. I tell a story um, in it in, in, in one of the chapters about C.S. Lewis and Owen Barfield. C.S. Lewis was a great medievalist and scholar in England. He was probably the most important Christian apologist of the 20th century. And he started a group, a literary group uh, in, in England, um, in the, I think it was the 1930s. Uh, he and J.R. Tolkien were the, the mainstays of that. But there was a person named Owen Barfield who was a British philosopher and poet uh, and somebody that Lewis knew for, for many, many years. And Lewis in his book, Surprised by Joy, uh, describes what he refers to as first friends and second friends. And he says, the first friends, for him it was a person named Arthur Greaves, somebody he knew since his childhood. He said, first friends are the kind of individuals that when you start the sentence, they're able to complete it. They're your alter ego. They see the world largely the same way that you do process it the same way. And we all need that. That's part of what human community, human attachment, human relationships uh, bring to us. But then Lewis described what he referred to as a second friend, and that was Owen Barfield. He said, the second friend is the person who's not your alter ego, but your anti-self. That's the person 
who he uh, describes it, who reads all the same books you do and draws all the wrong conclusions from those books. <laughs> and he has a section where he s talks about these debates that he had with Barfield, and they were pretty intense. They were esoteric debates, but they were about the role of, of imagination and reason. And, um, uh, and Lewis says that, you know, he and, and, and Barfield would go at it, hammer and tong, late into the night, learning the power of each other's punches, almost unconsciously beginning to absorb what the other person was saying. And out of this dogfight, a community of affection grew. And the punchline was that uh, Lewis and Barfield both treasured their relationship precisely because they saw the world somewhat differently than the other. And they felt like that their, their aperture of understanding was greater because they, they, they had each other in their life. And Barfield later said that when, when, when Lewis and I debated, we didn't debate for victory, we debated for truth. And that's just a, an entirely different way of approaching dialogue and conversation, which is, do you have something to say where I can learn? Can I come out of this conversation knowing something that I didn't before, knowing something about you, something about the nature of the world, something about experience that helps me see things better than I would have. And that goes back to the, what we were talking about earlier, which is epistemological modesty. Even if in some abstract sense, you know, you or I were 100% correct in, in, in our understanding of a particular issue, there's still no way that we could know the full truth and reality of things on any number of issues. That's just not within our capacity. That's why we need other people with, with other experiences to, um, to help us see and to, um, and to understand. And if we were able to take that to heart uh, and, and, uh, and to really incorporate it in our lives and embrace it, I think um, a lot of things in life would be better than they are. Well, I'll, I'll say something, say something uh, to, to that and then we'll, then we'll wrap this up. Uh, there's, there's a concept, an idea that I love, I love to use, which is uh, three sides of a coin. Most people look at coins with two sides. Right. But there's the edge, which is the third side. And so the, the, the concept is, you know, heads is one opinion, tails is another opinion, but then your opinion should, should sit on the edge where you should evaluate okay, where are the arguments, where are the perspectives are coming from, and then rationally come up with your own. Yeah. And I try to look at that because there's, you, you're hitting the nail on the head with a lot of stuff we've talked about on the show when it comes to perspective and what truth is and how people come to truths and then how people change and, and you know, essentially go from one side of the spectrum to another. And everything you're hitting on is just fascinating. Uh, and, and I'd love for our audience to learn more uh, about, about you. Would you mind talking about your most uh, recent book and where they can pick that up? Uh, and also how they can follow you. I know you uh, are, are contributing to The Atlantic uh, as well as to New York Times. Maybe talk about those uh, outlets so that the listeners can follow you. Sure, thanks for asking. The book that uh, I just wrote, which was published in uh, June from HarperCollins, is called, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Afraid Republic After Trump. And it's really an account of my life in politics, what I've learned, why I believe politics is important. Um, I think it's at a low moment, um, but I, I think, and, and a dangerous moment. Um, but I make the case that we need to do something about it because politics matters, because justice matters. And politics, it's about a lot of things, uh, and, and it's got its dark undersides, uh, as, as all professions do. But it's finally and fundamentally about justice. Um, and so the, the book, I wrote it in less than a year, but it's really the product of a lifetime in politics. And that's, people can get that on Amazon uh, or, or, or Barnes and Noble or, or any of the other outlets. Um, and uh, so that's the book. And then you're right, I, I'm a contributing editor for The Atlantic uh, magazine. And I write as well, I'm a contributing opinion writer for The New York Times. I'm a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public uh, Policy Center. Um, and, uh, so people can, can follow my work there. And I'm, uh, on Twitter at, uh, Peter underscore Wehner, W-E-H-N-E-R. And so I write about, um, about all sorts of issues. I've written uh, obviously about capitalism, um, about, about politics, about faith, about friendship. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then from time to time I interview people, I, I, for the Atlantic, I did a couple of interviews with David Brooks and his, on his new book, The Second Mountain, and then just most recently with George Will, 
uh, in his book, the one I mentioned earlier, the conservative sensibility. Um, so for me, it's 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 a it's a it's a lovely way to earn a living, which is for me to write and think and talk to intelligent people and um, and try and learn along the way. Well, Peter, it's been a, such a joy to, to speak with you. This has been an awesome conversation for me, and I'm hoping listeners got uh, as much out of it. But thank you again for, for your time. Thank you for the good that you're doing. And uh, we'll have to connect in the future sometime. I'd like to do it. I enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thanks. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye. Bye-bye.